I standing between you and lunch? I hope not. Uh, it's great to be in Ireland. My wife and I got to have a Guinness last night. We're having Irish food this evening, and we got to sample some Irish weather, so I feel like I've gotten all the things today. I want to talk about IBM's perspective on why we feel that the future of healthcare is cognitive technology. And to do that, I want to start by setting up some of the problem that we face today. So if you think about advances in healthcare, the technology has certainly advanced, thankfully, if you look at some of the machines on the top. Uh, that is not a world we live in anymore. I think if you've been to a hospital system, you appreciate the advances in how we treat and care for patients. But the art of medicine has not really advanced that much from the picture you see here. And if you think about it on a very simple level, when you are a physician and you uh, want to diagnose a patient, you go through basically a four-step process, right? You collect some data, you look at the patient in front of you, you get a medical history, you ask them how they're feeling, any medications they're taking, you run some tests. And with that, you'll formulate a hypothesis. You'll think you know what's wrong with this patient. You'll test that hypothesis, yeah, test that hypothesis, usually through uh, more tests uh, or the prescription of drugs. And then you will measure the outcome. Did it work? And then you'll go through that process again and again and again over time until you get a successful outcome and either the problem is resolved or the patient is feeling better. Slow clicker, nice. So even with all our advances in technology and data, we still have fundamental gaps in the healthcare system, right? So about 44% of all medical decisions, I'm sorry, about half of all medical decisions are not evidence-based. So there's still a lot of guesswork in the system. 44% um, of cancer treatments are switched after the initial line of therapy because they're not succeeding in treating uh, the cancer that the patient has. And our populations are aging at an ever alarming rate, which is just producing more and more uh, diagnostic challenges in the system. And I think there's a fundamental tendency to think that data is going to fix this problem. We go to conferences like this and we think about big data and the, the advent of big data and the use of big data, but the data tsunami is actually making the problem worse. So I'm sure everybody in here, uh, or most of you in here, have some type of wearable device. There we go. Uh, and because of that, in your lifetime, you are going to produce almost 1,100 terabytes of data from that device. Now, that data comes with an inherent flaw. So I have a heart rate monitor on my Apple Watch. If it spikes up to 200 beats per minute or drops down to 30 beats per minute, am I having a cardiac event? Or is that just a technological problem in that moment in time that the measurement was taken, right? So software needs to be smarter to figure out uh, whether that's something that's relevant or something that's not. 30% of data that you produce in your lifetime are going to be genomic. And we're just starting to tap into the infancy of genomic data and how we use that. And then there's the other 10% of the data that you actually produce in the medical system, which is your medical record, your prescriptions, your blood pressure, your heart rate, all of that stuff, right? So in the US, on top of this, our economics of healthcare are currently unsustainable. So we waste about 7.8, I'm sorry, we spend about seven, eight trillion worldwide on healthcare, and about 30% of that money is wasted. So these are big money problems uh, that we think intelligence can solve. So I want to talk about what IBM Watson Health is doing to address this, and it starts with the core technology of Watson. So if you don't understand what Watson is, Watson is a cognitive system. So if you've seen the Jeopardy uh, event that sort of launched Watson onto the field, Watson is not an artificial intelligence. You don't program Watson. Watson learns. So you feed it a bunch of data. It sifts through the data. It can read text-based data, natural language uh, inputs in terms of speech. It can read handwriting. Uh, with our acquisition of a company called Merge, in a few years, Watson will be able to see, read image-based data. And then you interact with Watson. So you talk to it. You say, I'm trying to solve this problem. And it sorts through the, technology, or the data set and brings back a probability of outcomes based on a chain of evidence. And then as you interact with Watson, it will actually learn and adapt to the problem that you're trying to solve. So it goes back into the data set and recalculates its hypotheses based on the chains of evidence. And this continues over and over and over and over again. So in the 1800s, the Industrial Revolution was spurred by the fact, by the first time in human history, the demand for goods and services was outpaced 
by the human capacity to produce them. And in a lot of ways, we're in, the, uh, we're in the beginnings of the knowledge revolution here. So we've taken data and we've applied analytics to it. In a lot of ways, that gives us information, right? How many of this versus how many of that? What are the trends lines? Are there correlations in the data? But when you apply a cognitive system on top of it, you actually start to get intelligence out of the data. So what do I mean by that? So in the United States, there's roughly 1.7 million drug discovery articles published per year. Right? That's an impossible amount of information for a human being to consume, let alone comprehend. So you need an intelligence to go into the system, consume all the data, understand what's important and what's not based on the problem you're trying to solve, and correlate the information to bring that back to you. So if you think about this, it's a good partnership. We talk about it as being a symbiotic relationship between the human and Watson. So humans are very good at specific things, right? We have moral values, we have a moral compass, we have imagination, we dream, right? We can think in abstraction. Cognitive systems are good at a lot very specific things, and I think the most important is endless capacity. So you can just feed it data set after data set after data set after data set. It doesn't get tired, it doesn't make mistakes, right? And it can constantly adapt its data set to the ever-growing uh, set of information. So we think that if we do this right, uh, we can enhance systems of care to really help people live healthier and more productive lives. And I'll go so far as to say that if we do our jobs right, uh, Watson will be the first technology in human history that you interact with from the moment you're conceived until the moment you die. So what would that look like? So if you think about how an individual manages their health, right? There's all these different factors that surround a person. All of these things have data that's consumed and produced, and none of those data sets talk to each other. So if you create a river of data with an intelligence on top of it that can connect the dots between all of these systems and make recommendations on how to live a better life, you can start to see how human beings get better care, they live healthier lives, they're more productive in their work and their families, et cetera. So, I want to give you some examples to bring this of life of like what our cognitive future can look like. I'm going to have my Marco Rubio moment and take a glass of water here. So think about education. The biggest challenge in education is research. There's huge amounts of library with huge amounts of information that are locked in books, which is great, except that researchers spend enormous amounts of time sifting through that data, trying to find the information that's relevant. If we fed all that information into Watson, the process of conducting research becomes much more expedient and efficient. The way we teach people how to be researchers change, because it's less about the process and the methodology of conducting research, and more about thinking and abstraction about how we solve different problems. Child welfare. In the United States, a child that hits uh, the welfare system in terms of being a ward of the state costs roughly $250,000. Those children are 25% more likely to uh, abuse drugs, have teen pregnancy, or be incarcerated. Uh, and most of the welfare system, child welfare system in the United States is analog. So we rely very heavily on caseworkers. Those caseworkers, in, in effect, become subject matter experts in terms of the adoption process, the state processes, how care is funded, what the best facilities are for these children. And all of that data is most likely contained, if you've ever walked into one of these facilities, in a notebook or a binder, right? So taking all, of, and it doesn't scale. So taking all of that information and putting it in a cognitive system would allow uh, Watson to make correlations in the data about how to build a plan that could best care for that child based on their circumstance, situation, match them to potential foster or adoptive parents, uh, put them with the best caseworkers or social workers, all based on correlations in the data uh, that make both the caseworker more productive and the child's life uh, more nurtured. And then I want to talk about wellness for a second, because I think this is where there's huge opportunities. So imagine you're going to have your knee replaced. Uh, if anybody's ever had orthopedic surgery, you know that your physician wants you to get in the best shape possible prior to, ha uh, prior to having the joint replaced. So imagine a system where an intelligence is telling you that, hey, based on your exercise patterns, I've noticed that when you get this much sleep or stretch this much or run this pace, you're more efficient and more effective in your exercise. Therefore, I've recalibrated your entire exercise regimen for you. Post-surgery, it monitors your range of motion, your physical therapy, 
uh, how you're doing on various aspects, and if it notices an anomaly in the system, uh, contacts the physician to flag it, or in some cases actually intervenes, calls you on the phone, asks you how you're doing. If it notices the data is uh, severe enough, we'll tie into the uh, practitioner's scheduling system, make you an appointment, and call you a car. That is a fundamentally different experience of being a patient, right? And all because the data talks to each other and is, has an intelligence on top of it. So at Watson Health, we have sort of two tiers, three tiers to our system. The core of it, the hero of the story, is Watson. Um, and then we have a layer of partnerships and acquisitions that we've made, which you see in the middle here, uh, between front ends to population health data and social software, and then partnerships with EMR providers, uh, Johnson & Johnson, Medtronic, and Apple. And then we have an ecosystem on top of that of people that are building on top of Watson's core technologies. So there's literally nothing you can, can't do with uh, the Watson platform currently. So I guess I would leave you with this question. Watson currently has a HIPAA compliant cloud, uh, over 30 APIs which you can tap into, uh, hundreds of millions of patient lives worth of data for you to start noodling around with. You're a technology crowd. You're here because you want to invent the future. And I'm leaving you with the question that what will you do with Watson Health? Thank you. <laughs>